elegance. What does it mean? Something about grace and style, about impeccable proportion and balance, about timeless understated beauty. Fashion designer Giorgio Armani, who built a successful career offering elegance to both men and women, said this, Elegance doesn't mean being noticed. It means being remembered. What does the word elegance call to mind? Classical Greek architecture, perhaps? Perhaps Mozart and Mendelssohn? We might call a mathematical proof elegant if it demonstrates something clearly with a minimum of easily understandable steps. A Japanese tea ceremony? A chambered nautilus shell? During the 19th century, American organ builders confidently created an art of style, sophistication, and elegance. Their instruments were reliable and modern, and they achieved considerable success in business. In 1800, we were a new, young country with boundless possibilities. We were a people with energy and drive. We were a hybrid people, as we still are, influenced by many different cultures and geographic backgrounds. Come with me as we explore the elegant art created by 19th century American organ builders. Because of time constraints, we will see only some notable highlights. Many more wonderful instruments built by fine craftsmen will remain untouched tonight, and I hope to stimulate your interest enough to learn more about them. In 1800, there was one active, mature school of organ building in the U.S. It derived directly from the organ building culture of central Germany. Among the many immigrants to America at the time were groups of Moravians, followers of the teachings of early reformer Jan Hus. They came mostly to rural Pennsylvania and North Carolina seeking religious freedom. Music, both sacred and secular, was an important part of their culture, so a small group of organ builders sprang up among them, of whom David Tannenberg was the most important. Here he is, voicing an organ with the help of an assistant. He was born in Saxony in 1728 and trained as a woodworker. He emigrated to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania at the age of 21 and eventually became assistant to an organ builder from Germany, Gottlob Klemm. Tannenberg worked with Klemm for five years until Klemm's death, then continued building organs under his own name. He died in 1804, literally while working on his organ in York, Pennsylvania. Here is a chronological series of images of the Tannenberg originally in Home Moravian Church, Salem, North Carolina, now in the Old Salem Visitor Center, a short walk away from the church. The organ was restored by Taylor and Booty Organ Builders in 2004. Listen to Peter Sykes at its rededication as he plays two preludes by English Moravian composer Christian Latrobe.
Late in his career, Tannenberg was assisted by his son-in-law, Philip Bachmann, who built seven organs under his own name after a falling out with the elder builder. His 1819 organ for Myerstown, Pennsylvania, eventually found its way to St. John's Lutheran Church in Tacoma. After 1933, all that remained was the facade, the key desk area, mm -hmm. some pipes, and a little bit of interior mechanism. Paul Fritz, Bruce Scholl, and their co-workers reconstructed the instrument from the available parts and information, and it is currently for sale. Bachmann eventually turned to building pianos and cabinetry, and no other builder appeared to take up Tannenberg's mantle. While the Moravian school of organ building, with its German origins, was dying out, a new artistic line was developing in the Northeast, whose builders initially looked to England for inspiration. In the religious landscape of New England in 1800, Calvinist churches, which we would call congregational, were the dominant feature. For many of the faithful in New England, organs were associated with Roman Catholicism and so looked on with suspicion. It took a third of the century for organs to find a place in many churches. The few Episcopal churches were better disposed towards organs, but they at first were still recovering from being on the losing side of the War of Independence. In the late 18th century, small chamber organs of a few stops were not uncommon in the homes of the well-to-do, and some found their way into churches. They were mostly of English make. A number of clever New Englanders, usually craftsmen familiar with technical work, repaired and tuned these imported instruments, and so became familiar with organ mechanisms. A few advanced to the point where they built small organs of their own, Thomas Johnston, Josiah Leavitt, Henry Pratt, George Kaplan. The young William Goodrich worked as a helper to Pratt for eight months. After relocating and leaving Pratt's employ, the two remained friends and shared ideas and information. In 1804, Goodrich set up shop and continued building organs in a variety of places in and around Boston with a variety of sometime partners. His brother Ebenezer worked with him at times, but most of Ebenezer's career was spent creating small chamber organs under his own name. In 1806, William Goodrich hired Thomas Appleton, a young cabinet maker, who remained in his shop for five years. Appleton learned the organ builder's art and proceeded to produce his own instruments. The Goodrich brothers and Appleton were pivotal figures in American organ building, not only because of their own instruments, but because of the many builders they trained. A large percentage of American organ builders and organ firms, even into the 20th century, can trace their lineage directly to these three Boston craftsmen. William Goodrich would have been even more influential had he not died of stroke at the too young age of 56 in 1833. Appleton was active as a builder until the age of 81 in 1867 and lived five more years in retirement. He was universally loved as the ever-gracious grand old man of Boston organ building. The organs produced in America in the early 19th century would have been completely familiar to any English organist. We were politically independent of England, but in organ building, we were still a colony. Visually, organs in both places tended to follow classical styling, and their tone was light and often described as silvery. Here is Lois Regestein playing the choral song by Samuel Sebastian Wesley, on the 1843 Appleton in Leeds, New York.
listen to a piece of George Frederick Handel written for a musical clock played on the four-foot flute stop at Leeds. It's not hard to imagine you are listening to a flutist playing an early 19th century wooden transverse flute. The brothers Elias and George G. Hook trained in William Goodrich's shop, and in 1827 George built his first organ, a small chamber instrument for a Boston merchant. It's likely that much of the case was made by their father, an experienced cabinet maker. The organ still exists in the Peabody Essex Museum in the Hook's hometown of Salem, Massachusetts. Their firm lasted more than a hundred years and was for much of that time one of the most influential in the country. George Stevens, another graduate from Goodrich's shop, began his own business across the Charles River in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1833. He was a good businessman and civic leader who served as Cambridge's mayor for a time. His artistic approach was conservative, and he continued to produce beautiful organs into the 1890s that looked and sounded similar to what he had built 50 years earlier. Organ building in New York developed in a similar manner to Boston, first with English instruments either in the parlors of the rich or in a small number of progressive churches. English or German immigrant builders repaired and rebuilt these instruments, added their own new instruments, eventually training American-born builders. None of these small early instruments have survived. The first New York builder of note was Thomas Hall, who relocated to New York from Philadelphia in about 1817. He worked with a number of partners over the years. One of his early apprentices was Henry Urban, and the business eventually became Hall and Urban, a partnership that lasted 14 years. By all accounts, Urban was an excellent craftsman and businessman, as well as an irascible curmudgeon. Many of Urban's instruments were small parlor organs, which had to be fine pieces of furniture as well as musical instruments. This one from 1830 is in Old Salem Village, North Carolina, the same community where we have previously seen two Tannenbergs. It contains this very soft stop placed there to preserve visual symmetry. Urban's most famous instrument was the three-manual 1846 organ for Trinity Church on Wall Street. Its design was the result of three years of battles between Urban and the equally combative English organist of the church, Edward Hodges. As the organ neared completion, their conflict reached the point where the builder threw the organist bodily out of his own organ loft. Today, all that remains of this landmark instrument is the case, with its rare but not unique division hung on the gallery rail, what we would call a rook positive. Urban the New Yorker was one of the foremost suppliers of organs to the southern states, including this large 1845 instrument in the Huguenot Church in Charleston, South Carolina. His organs typically featured Gothic-style cases. Their sound, unlike their maker, was described as gentle and refined. Thomas Rob John came to New York from England and built organs in the middle of the century this 1859 organ features draw knobs on vertical stop jams on either side of the keyboards and doors that can close over the key desk. This was typical of English-influenced organs in the first half of the century. 
George Jardine was another English immigrant. He served an apprenticeship and studied architecture in London before coming to New York with his family in 1837. His son Edward gradually took over the business after 1860 and the firm survived until 1899. The Jardines tended to offer the organist many of the latest mechanical innovations, including reversibles, early combination and crescendo actions, and pneumatic assist actions. They were some of the first to experiment with electric action. The 19th century saw enormous growth in America's population and the fulfillment of what many believed was its manifest destiny to expand all the way across the continent to the Pacific Ocean. The many gold and silver strikes especially brought huge population increases to the West. The completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869 cut the travel time coast to coast from the better part of a year to about a week. The time was favorable for unprecedented development in many industries, including organ building. During the period around the Civil War and afterward, American organists became less provincial and more aware of developments in Europe. In particular, many students traveled to Germany to study and listen. They heard bigger, more robust sounds than the light, silvery English-style organs they knew in America and they learned how to play the pedals, which in most English and American organs were very limited or completely absent. They brought these influences back home and American organ builders responded. American organs evolved away from the classical visual style and included more foundation sound, more stops, more manuals, more pedals. Even at the end of the century, though, American organs always had a balanced sound throughout the spectrum from low to high. Foundation stops never overpowered the sparkle of the upper work. It was not until after 1900 that choruses disappeared, smothered by ponderous orchestral sounds made possible by electric action and higher wind pressures. As the Hook brothers approached retirement, more of the management of the company fell to their trusted employee, Frank Hastings, and in 1871 the firm became E. and G. G. Hook and Hastings. By that time, their modern factory was averaging one finished organ a week. Listen to Bruce Stevens playing the magnificent 1871 Hook at St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church, New Haven, he plays the Fantasy and Fugue in B-flat by Alexandre Boilly as we watch a parade of hook organs from 1835 to 1899.
At the mid-century point, our country looked to New York as its center of business and to Boston as its center of art and culture. But Boston had no large venue for music. Concerts were given in churches and smaller private halls. Jenny Lind, the Swedish Nightingale, a bona fide rock star before there were such things, came to Boston and had to sing in the unfinished Fitchburg Railroad Station because it was the biggest room in town. Even at 1,500 capacity plus standing room, they turned people away. A committee of musical and civic leaders was formed to remedy the situation with a grand music hall. Of course, it was planned to have a splendid organ. The organ selection process was riddled with politics and prejudice, and ultimately the organ was commissioned from E.F. Volker in Germany. This was a clear slap in the face to the American organ building industry and the hook firm in particular, whose factory was only a few miles from the music hall. After completion in the Volker factory, the music hall's organ languished for several years before finally being installed in 1863. The elaborate dedication festivities featured the best organists in Boston, which is much the same as saying many of the best organists in the country. The organ's action was universally criticized as heavy and slow and barely playable. Only 21 years later, the organ was put into storage and the hall remodeled for the new Boston Symphony Orchestra. It remained unused for more than two decades, and finally the pipework was installed on reliable electric action slider chests, in a beautiful, though much smaller, hall in Methuen, Massachusetts, by wealthy benefactor Edward Searles. Today, tonally, it is a mixture of the original Volker sounds and work from the 1947 rebuild by G. Donald Harrison and the Aeolian Skinner Company. Concerts can be heard here every week during the summer. The Hook Brothers, meanwhile, answered this brush-off from the Music Hall Committee with two of their finest instruments. The same year that the Volker was installed, they completed this large three-manual organ for the Jesuit Church of the Immaculate Conception in South Boston. The combination of the organ and the reverberant acoustic and the visual setting was spectacular. In the 1970s, Thomas Murray made a number of wonderful recordings on the organ that raised awareness of 19th century American organs. After a long period of decline, the church closed and was divided into luxury condos. The organ is in storage and Boston College is hoping to build a grand concert hall to house it. This four-manual concert hall instrument was completed by the Hooks in 1864 in Mechanics Hall in Worcester, Massachusetts. The organ was electrified, but the tracker and pneumatic assist action was restored by Fritz Noack and it's still heard today. George S. Hutchings went to work as a case maker in the Hook Factory in 1857. After army service in the Civil War and a few more years with the Hooks, he entered a partnership with several other organ builders. He remained in business either on his own or with a variety of partners until 1904. His organs were known for excellence of tone and elegance of design. So much so that he supplied this 1890 organ for the new St. Paul residence of James J. Hill, the Empire Builder, the president of Great Northern Railroad, and one of the richest men in the world. Here is Cheryl Drews playing U.B. Blake's Baltimore Toodaloo on the 1895 Hutchings in North Middleboro, Massachusetts. <laughs>
The Boston area was the center of New England organ building and accounted for a large part of the organ production of the whole country. An important smaller hub developed in central Massachusetts around Springfield with William A. Johnson, J.W. Steer, Emmons Howard, and others. Still more builders were active in rural areas throughout New England. In New York in the last quarter of the 19th century, brothers Hilborn and Frank Roosevelt challenged the Urban and Jardine firms as leading builders. Members of a prominent family, Teddy Roosevelt was their cousin, they had the capital to build first quality organs and pursue much new technology that was appearing near the end of the century. Hilborn, the leader of the firm, died at the age of 37 and was succeeded by Frank, who died only eight years later at the age of 33. Even so, they created many excellent instruments and some landmarks. Had they lived, they certainly would have been important leaders at least into the early 20th century. Of course, many organs were built outside the Northeast. The English immigrant Henry Pilcher arrived in this country in 1832 and held a variety of jobs, including with Henry Urban, and built some organs under his own name in and around New York. In 1852, he opened a shop in St. Louis and established a reputation as a leading Midwestern builder, often supplying reliable, basic instruments for small country churches. The George Kilgan Company tells a similar history. George immigrated from Germany, settled for a time in New York, and eventually found success moving his business in 1873 to St. Louis. To a great extent, they served small country churches as well as a few larger places as the middle part of the country was being settled. Here is Seattle's oldest surviving pipe organ. This 12 rank 1890 Kilgan came to First Presbyterian Church, Seattle, and was dedicated by the renowned English organist Frederick Archer. It's owned now by Pacific Lutheran University and resides in the chapel of Trinity Lutheran Church in Tacoma. This 1887 Kilgan was originally in First Baptist Church of Los Angeles, the only three manual organs south of San Francisco. It was the preferred concert instrument of the well-known organist Clarence Eddy when he visited Los Angeles. It came to Holy Rosary Roman Catholic Church in Edmonds in 1982. The Hinners and Albertson Company of Pekin, Illinois did a brisk business in the 1890s among the small Midwestern churches and made good use of promotional catalogs at a time when the Sears Roebuck or Montgomery Ward catalogs were common household items. They used many standardized designs to cut costs, but, like Kilgan and Pilcher, always produced reliable, good-sounding instruments that could stand the rigorous climate of the Midwest and remain playable for years between infrequent visits from the organ tuner. As the classical case designs of the early 19th century gave way to a new aesthetic, the facades of organs began to sport more decoration, mirroring a similar movement in the art of interior design. During the 1870s and 80s, the practice of stenciling pipes rose to great heights. As the century drew to a close, the pendulum of taste again swung to simpler decoration, with less stencils and fewer colors. Here is a small sampling of organ facades in chronological order, accompanied by Mendelssohn's Andante and Variations in D major, played by James Hammond on the 1890 George Kilgan and Son organ in Portland, Oregon.
We have covered a lot of territory in just a few minutes. Hundreds of other wonderful instruments will have to wait till another time. Please join us for the Zoom reception after this video. You can find the link on the Tacoma AGO website. Thank you for traveling along with me through a century of elegance.